God, we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor. Father, we declare that you are great and greatly to be praised, Father. God, we thank you for the love that you have for each one of us, God. As your word says that, that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. And that's how you chose to demonstrate your love for us, God. God, we're overwhelmed and, and also we're uh, just filled with joy. God, knowing that, uh, that even as Christ gave his life for us, he rose victoriously. And God, we just celebrate uh, the victory that we have through Christ not because of anything that we've done, but because of what's been done on our behalf, Father. God, we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's so good to be able to worship together. He is risen. He is risen Amen. Amen. Happy Easter Saturday. Does that feel weird to anybody? Yeah. All right. Well, we're glad that you're here. Before we're seated, uh, we're going to take a moment to greet one another. And before, you're, before you sit, if you would take a moment and kind of squeeze in to the inside of your row, that would make a little room for people who may still be coming along the aisles. Uh, and then you can have a seat. Well, happy, happy Easter, everybody. It is awesome to be with you. We have been praying for this weekend, excited to see what God would do through it. And if you're joining us today, visiting, checking in, uh, you came across us on the web or uh, somebody invited you out today, glad you took that step. We get to celebrate Jesus rising every day. So uh, Easter is a, an opportunity to do that in a unique way. Uh, but man, we get to celebrate what Jesus has done and continues to do every single day of our lives. And we're glad that you came out this weekend to be a part of it. I do want to take a second. We're going to do something a little bit different. As you came in today, you got one of these bulletins, right? So uh, pull it on out real quick. Everybody take a second, pull it out, and, uh, and let's stare at it for a moment. And I uh, want to you know, just draw your attention to a couple things. Number one, um, there's a couple events on the front of this. We'd love for you to check those out, whether it's communities or we got a marriage workshop coming up. Um, but I would love for you to turn it to the back right here. And if you have a phone on you right now, I'm going to do this with you. Go ahead and take your phone out in church of all places. Look at that. Pull it on out. And uh, if you don't have a smartphone, if you got a dumb phone, it's okay. We love you. But how? How do you still have one? Well, I, like they sell those still? Uh, anyway, take out your phone, and we're all going to do this together. We'd love to learn and know how you guys found out about Emergence. If you've been around here a while, we'd love to know where you're from. We'd also love to get the opportunity to share a prayer request. We've got a great prayer team that would love to pray for you. So there's a QR code there on the back on this white side. There's two QR codes. We're looking at the one on this side. And if you would go ahead and just open up your camera, and you can scan that right here. There we go. And it'll pull up a nice little form there. Let's all take a minute and let's fill this out together. Even if you've been here a million years, because we would love to know who's with us today. We'd also love to know if you have any questions, how we can better serve you. Uh, and so if you just, uh, you know, if you have a problem with, problem with the QR code, if you don't know how to use that, tap the neighbor next to you who maybe looks maybe a few years younger. It's okay. So we have, we have no shame in, in help here. And go, how do I use this QR thing? And, uh, and go ahead and fill that out. There's just a couple questions on there. Uh, it's, it would be really helpful for us to know if everybody fills it out, that we have the opportunity to know where you're from, how we can help you, and how you found out about the church. And if you'd like to stay in the loop on all things about emergence, you can check the box there as well. And if you have any prayer requests, we would love to, uh, to know, and we would pass those on to our prayer team. They love praying throughout the week for anything on your heart. And uh, yeah, so thanks for taking a moment to do that together. As we uh, continue on here today, we are so excited to share with you um, the truth of what Jesus has done in rising from death and conquering over anything that stands between us and the life that God has for us. And so excited to hear from his word today. Uh, and as we, we turn to that, why don't we take a moment and check this out. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. 
But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. All right, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Um, this is me fired up, so <laughs> soak it all in. We have a bulletin once a year. And some of you guys grew up in churches, they're like, that's a page, that's not a bulletin. They're like newspapers. And so, um, hey, great to be with you. Uh, if you're visiting, my name's Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we gather every week. We teach through the Bible. And just want to say we're really glad that you are here. If you are visiting, want to let you know in a few weeks on April 13th, we have a, a marriage conference. You're welcome to come out to that. Maybe you're like, I don't know where I'm at with God. I'm trying to figure that out. But I do know. Uh, I, I want to be the best husband or best wife I can be, and we have a great speaker coming in on April 13th, and you're invited to check that out, and we'd love for you to join us on that day, and so excited for it. I always think it takes a lot of courage to walk into a church for the first time, uh, and you're like, it's Saturday, and I'm, uh, you know, it's celebrating Easter, uh, but really glad that you're here, and uh, really excited to celebrate with you guys today. We look at an awesome text. Today is the greatest event in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most important event in human history, the most significant, life-changing, uh, human history-altering event that God promised he'd send one who would die and rise for sins, and just as he promised, Jesus did it. He died and he rose, and today we look at a very brief passage as we look at this text about the resurrection of Jesus. It's in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24, uh, Luke chapter 24, we see on Friday night, Jesus is crucified. There at the cross, he uh, essentially dies through suffocation, most people believe. That's how people would die in crucifixion. Fiction. At the crucifixion, he's pronounced dead by a professional executioner. He's then placed in a guarded tomb that's sealed and guarded, which is pretty wild on Saturday. We're not going to worry too much about this detail because it's Saturday. Uh, he lays at rest and uh, Jewish Sabbath and then early the next day on, on Sunday morning, we see this incredible account where Luke picks it up. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. So it's Easter morning. The women come down to prepare the body. And as they're going down, they have this conversation about how are we going to get the stone rolled away? And as they get there, everything's out of order, right? The, the stone's rolled away. The guard who's supposed to be there guarding the tomb has left. The tomb's empty. The grave clothes are folded. There's no fight scene. There's no rescue. The guards are gone. The the, the clothes are folded up, and as they're sitting there wondering about what on earth is happening in this crazy scene, two angels show up. And they ask the, what I think is one of the most important questions anyone could ever ask. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And then they're going to do some review with them. They're going to be like, hey, remember, this is what he told you. Right? Remember throughout Jesus' ministry, if you, if you ever want to study this and go home and just look at the Bible, you'll see over and over again as Jesus is doing his ministry, as he's teaching, as he's walking with the disciples, he tells them on numerous occasions, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed and handed over and arrested and crucified. And on the third day, I'm going to rise. And he's like, hey, remember, this is all happening just as he had instructed you. And I love it because, you know, this should, he's like, okay, 
this shouldn't be a surprise. Like, this is what he said. Even the enemies of Jesus know this is what he said. This is why they guarded the tomb in the first place. Remember, Pilate puts them in the tomb, and they're like, hey, how do we make sure nothing crazy happens? Because he said throughout his ministry he was going to die and rise from death. And so what they do is they say, well, let's guard the tomb. They guarded these tombs with war hero soldiers. It was like a way of like honorable retirement. If you were a war hero, you knew war, you knew battle. And the cost actually of losing, because it's a pretty sweet job to guard a tomb. It's usually pretty easy. Um, and the guards knew if anything ever happens, they just take their own lives because it was such utter humiliation. But these are, you know, war-hardened warriors. And, and they were tasked to guard this tomb. And even his enemies knew, hey, let's make sure we guard it because throughout his ministry, he taught he was going to die and on the third day rise. The angel's like, remember, that's what he taught. So two huge truths that the angels remind the women of. The first is that, remember, he must be handed over and be crucified. Now remember that, it's interesting language. He must do that. See, if if you're new to the Bible, what the Bible teaches is that God creates the world. And in the first book of the Bible, what we find is God is creator, he makes mankind, he makes this world good, and God walks with mankind. In that state, in the book of Genesis, it's awesome for two chapters, right? God walks with man, there's peace between God and man, there's peace between mankind and one another, there's peace between mankind and creation. You're like, I read the news today, something's gone horribly wrong. Yes, something has gone horribly wrong. And what we find is in Genesis 3, mankind sins. The moment mankind sins, it breaks the relationship between God and man. Now as a result of that, mankind's relationship with one another gets broken. Mankind's relationship with all creations broken. Rather than acknowledging their sin, mankind in their sin blames, mankind in their sin hides from God. What's amazing is in Genesis 3, man doesn't turn to God, God comes after man. And this is important, you're going to see this throughout the whole Bible. Some of you guys, this is your story. I keep running from God, God keeps coming after me. I keep trying to say, God, leave me alone, I want to do life my way, God keeps pursuing me. Our God is a loving God who pursues us even when we fall and rebel against him. Mankind sins. As a result, everything breaks. Here's the truth of the Bible. Everything in this world that is broken and the stuff that we do that's wrong, the stuff that happens to us that's wrong, what the Bible teaches is at the root of that, underneath all the problems, is sin. And the reality is, because of our sin, we're separated from relationship as we should have with God the Father. God is the source of love and joy and peace and truth and life. And trying to find those things, love, joy, peace, truth, life, outside of right relationship with God the Father, is like trying to breathe oxygen while denying air. It's like, I want to breathe I just don't want to have to deal with oxygen. That's like trying to say, I want to have life, I want to have joy, I want to be the most loving person I can be without acknowledging God. He's the source of those things. And you cannot ultimately have those things in their fullest expression outside of a right relationship with Him. And so what the Bible teaches from Genesis 3 is that God makes a promise. God says, I'm going to send one who will crush the work of sin. He will be bruised, but he will ultimately crush the work of sin and allow reconciliation with God. That's on the third chapter of your Bible in Genesis. The whole Old Testament, so the Bible's an Old Testament and a New Testament. The entire Old Testament is like a telescope zooming in, going, who is this one that God will send to crush the work of sin? Who is this one that God will send who will allow us to be reconciled to God? And we see all these details that he's going to come through the nation of Israel. He's going to come through the line of David. We see prophecies about this coming Messiah, this coming great hope. 
And then we get to the New Testament, and there we see Jesus. And Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promised longing of the Messiah. In fact, later in this chapter, in Luke 24, it'd be really awesome to go home and just read the whole chapter today. It's an incredible chapter. Uh, Jesus appears to two men on a road, and he's walking with them. And he opens up the Old Testament. Here's what the Bible says. He shows them how the entire thing points to him. He's like, see, Moses leading his people out of slavery and saving them based upon whose home is covered in the blood of the lamb. That's pointing to me, right? Nehemiah building a city for the people of God who will flourish. I'm the one who will build the ultimate city for the people of God. He's like, look, the whole thing points to me over and over. I'm the true king. I'm the true prophet. I'm the true priest. The whole Old Testament is pointing to me. And Jesus comes, this sinless, perfect son of God, and he goes to the cross, and look at the language, he must be crucified for sin. That God must make an offering for our sin. If Jesus doesn't go to the cross, there is no offering for sin. Remember what Jesus says on the cross, it is finished, right? Sin is paid for. If Jesus doesn't do that, we perish in our sins, separated from God. But remember the message of Genesis. God comes after mankind. God sends his son who willfully goes to a cross to pay for sin in our place as our substitute. That's why it says he must be crucified. Sometimes people are like, well, what about this religion or what about that religion? Here's just something that's true. Jesus is the only religious leader and founder who right now lives whose tomb is empty, who has reigned for the last 2,000 years at the right hand of God the Father, who all those who put their faith and trust in him today live. They were not disappointed. So it says he must be crucified, and he must what? Rise from death. Here's the great hope of the Christian faith. Jesus rose. All his teaching, all his life finds its vindication at the resurrection. I always love how Paul says it. If Jesus didn't rise, let us eat and drink. Tomorrow we die. Like your life has no purpose. We're just worm food spinning on a rock in space with no meaning, with no purpose, just a darkened existence. But Paul goes, but he did rise. And if someone came and said, I'm going to live a sinless life. I'm going to go to a cross and pay for sins. I'm going to die and on the third day rise. And if that really happened, just as was promised, that must change everything. Here's what's crazy to me. There are people that are so kind of hardened in their position that they can see the evidence And they can see the reality of lives changed by the resurrection. Um, Truths like the disciples who were great cowards who were suddenly at the resurrection are incredibly emboldened. Or the prophecies that talk about the death, burial, and resurrection fulfilled in in Christ. Or the the eyewitnesses who saw the resurrected Christ. Both friends and family, but also enemies. People who were were enemies to Jesus saw him resurrected. They're like, I should change my position. And they do. Right? And, and the disciples themselves give their lives, not for what they believed, but for what they saw. Right? All of them go to their deaths for what they were eyewitnesses of, and none of them recant. And if you've ever done jury duty, you know that's not how it works. Like two people roll over on each other instantly. Here are 12. All of them die basically in poverty and suffering, not for what they believe, but for what they saw. I saw him resurrected. I cannot deny what I saw. And they go to their deaths for it. And all of them saw and said it changed everything. The reality of the resurrection changed their position. And what's wild to me is there are some that are so hardened in their position that they would choose in spite of the evidence to remain as they were. In spite of the reality and the facts and the history and the prophecies to go, I refuse to bow my knee to God. But the angel says, he must pay for sin and he must rise from death. 
And Christ did both. And today we celebrate. So let's, let's have the courage to ask the question the angels ask. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Here, here's the honest question the angel forces us to ask. Where today do I seek life? And will I find life there? How many people are seeking their ultimate life in something like pleasure? They go in and say, I'm just living for pleasure. I'm living for a good meal or a good trip or the next good trip or the next good meal. And everyone who studies this stuff shows that the people who live for pleasure end up the most broken and the most miserable. And yet still, why? Because they're seeking the living where there's death. So some people it's not pleasure, some people it's career. They're seeking some sort of status or power or achievement in career accomplishment. Well, Steve Jobs, I mean, he gave us incredible technological advances. He had an incredible career. He was brilliant. But today he's dead because life's not found ultimately in our careers. How many marriages end up destroyed because people live for career? How many families end up blown up because people put their family on the altar of their career? Why do you seek the living among the dead when career is dead? Career is a gift when used right for the glory of God. But when it becomes the main thing we live for, why do we seek the living among the dead? Some of you guys, you so want to please God. Right? You, 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 it's not like you're like disagreeing. You're going, to, I want to be right with God. And yet you think you can be right with God by good works that I'm going to be good enough to get to heaven. But the, what, what the Bible teaches is that all of us, even our best works, even the best things we do fall short. You know what does not fall short? Christ, his work for you, his broken body, his shed blood. Christ is the one. I, I like when people are like, well, he was such a good teacher. I'm like, do you know what he taught? I'm God. I'm going to die for sins and rise from death. And one, of, one of my favorites is in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way. He doesn't say I'm coming to point to a way. He doesn't say I'm coming to show the way. He says, I am the way. And I am the truth. And I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And if we live trying to seek life outside of him, even in good works. We seek life where there's no life. Our good works, the Bible says, are, are like filthy rags before a holy God. But Christ's good work on the cross said it is finished. Why do we seek the living among the dead? Do you have the courage to ask? Honestly, where today am I seeking life? Popularity? social media followers, power, money, attractiveness? Am I seeking life in that I'm just really true to myself? So I'm like, I'm me. <laughs> right? Like, and because I'm me, I can't change even if it's seeking the living among the dead because you're not the source of life? Do you seek life in your pride where you refuse to bow your knee? Where are you seeking life? Because the good news of Easter, there is life. There's one who took the grave and death and sin and conquered it. And today he lives. And he offers life. 
the angel says, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why not seek life where there's life? Seek life in the risen Son of God who conquered death just as was prophesied, just as was promised, just as was witnessed. Today he lives and the reality of that changes everything. Meaning, you can know the hope of forgiveness of sins, of eternal life, of victory over the grave, that like Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and everyone who believes in me, even though he dies, he shall live. Because like Jesus in the resurrection, he lives and goes through death, and the hope of the resurrection is that even though we die, we will in Christ go through death and be resurrected as the people of God, reigning with him forever and ever. And today, I challenge you, would you take his gift? Would you take the gift of life where there's actually life? The one who conquered death. There's only one. Your career doesn't conquer death. Your achievements don't. I always love when teams win the Super Bowl and they're like, now we're immortal. I'm like, dude, no one will remember you. <laughs> like, you know, Jesus lives. And the good news of the Bible is that he must die and rise for sin. But has he died and risen for your sin? Jesus' life, is he your life? And today, if you want to respond, here's the good news of the whole Bible. You can ask him. You can say, you know what? I'm willing to change. I'm tired of seeking life where there's death. I'm tired of being hard-hearted. I'm tired of remaining in my pride. Today, I'm willing to take life. So God, forgive my sin. Thank you that you died for my sin. Help me put my hope and faith in you. And let me grab hold of the one that's truly life the forgiveness that's found in you. If that's you, you can pray and you can ask. And, and you can ask him even now as we pray. And then we'll worship the one who's worthy of it and lives. And so let's pray together. God, thank you that there is the reality of life, that Jesus came and shows us that the biggest issue we have is our sin, which causes death and separation from you. And Lord, we cannot find life outside of you. But God, in Christ, we can have our sins forgiven. And so, Lord, I pray for those today who are willing to say, God, forgive my sins. God, be my God. Be the hope of life for me. God, I'm, I'm tired of running from you. I'm tired of being in rebellion from you. I'm tired of looking for life where there is no life. And God, help me to find life that's only found in you. Would you be my God? Would you forgive my sins? Would I live my life for you for all eternity? Thank you for dying for me. Help me to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand? Let's continue to worship together.
Amen. He's risen. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So we're going to celebrate all weekend and hope you guys have a great celebration this weekend of the resurrection of Christ. I want to let you know before you go, if you would like prayer for anything before you leave, we have a prayer team that's going to be over there against that wall. They're happy to pray for you with whatever's going on. And uh, I'd love to pray for you before we head out. God, thank you that you are the God who is life, the God who forgives sins, and the God who delights to give us the hope of eternity. God, we rejoice that the tomb is empty, that these aren't just words we say on Easter, but they're words that change all of eternity, that you promised to send your son to die and rise for sins, and you did just as you promised, and change the whole world, Lord. God, today we pray changes us. We ask it all for your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Easter, everyone.